bonjour à tous. Je fais juste une petite introduction, euh, vite fait, avant de passer la main à Brian. Euh, ben, bienvenue déjà à cette session. Euh, sponsorisé Microsoft, voilà, comme quoi qui, qui l'eût cru. Je n'aurais pas cru me retrouver dans une salle à DevOx cette année, pour être très honnête avec vous. Je m'appelle Sébastien, je fais partie d'une équipe chez Microsoft qui s'appelle Developer Experience. Je suis évangéliste technique, donc je suis un développeur depuis euh, pas mal d'années. Euh, et je m'occupe aussi de tout ce qui est open source chez Microsoft. Et aujourd'hui, euh, on a invité Brian, qui est ici, qui va se présenter juste après, qui vient de Corp donc de notre corporation à Seattle, et qui est euh, Monsieur Java chez nous. Donc il est euh, Senior Program Manager euh, sur Java. Alors ça peut paraître un petit peu bizarre comme ça de dire qu'on a des gens qui font du Java chez nous, mais c'est le cas, euh, puisque euh, vous avez sûrement euh, lu, vu euh, euh, un petit peu la mouvance aujourd'hui qu'il y a euh, dans notre société euh, et la stratégie vers laquelle on s'oriente. On fournit de plus en plus euh, euh, de, de produits euh, euh, en open source, et aussi, on développe aussi pas mal de choses sur... Alors là, on parle de Java aujourd'hui, euh, comme des SDK, etc. Euh, d'ailleurs, si vous venez sur notre stand, d'ailleurs, on a des démos que l'on a fait en Java avec des SDK que l'on produit. Donc c'est pour ça qu'on a aussi des gens qui, euh, qui développent en Java chez nous. Euh, et donc, on va un petit peu vous expliquer un petit peu tout ça euh, au travers d'un talk d'une heure. Donc bon, alors évidemment, Brian est euh, américain. Donc euh, le talk sera en anglais. Donc j'espère que ça ne dérange pas beaucoup, enfin pas trop en tout cas ceux qui sont ici. Et si jamais vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à venir nous voir après sur le stand ou euh, ici pour, pour qu'on essaye d'y répondre. Brian, it's up to you. Merci. <laughs> so thanks for coming guys today. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about how uh, Microsoft learned to love Java as I'm sure uh, was, was explained. Um, and, uh, you know, really, uh, the question becomes, well, actually, let's just go through. So I'm going to talk about why Java and Azure. I'm going to talk about some of our platform uh, uh, achievements uh, and then some SDKs and tooling that we have for Java and some new developments as well. But, um, you know, why is Microsoft interested in working with the Java community and building tools for Java developers and things. I mean, we already have sort of the half of the .NET, uh, or sorry, half of the enterprise world with .NET and Windows and things like that. Uh, you know, and, and now that we have Azure, we have this amazing platform that's open that you can run pretty much anything on. Um, and one of the things that's uh, transpired the last couple of years is without very much effort, on the part of Microsoft and the part of Azure's team, um, we've ended up with about 25% of our virtual machines uh, running on Linux. So we've always had the option of either running on Windows or running on Linux on the cloud, with our, just with our virtual machines. And um, a lot of our customers have chosen to run Linux on those uh, without any effort on our part. A very small team compared to the Windows and .NET teams that we have. Uh, so this is very interesting to uh, our senior executives uh, and very interesting to our engineers as well. You know, the, the whole DNA of Microsoft is is coding and development and uh, getting into other programming languages and making our tools and technologies the best they can be uh, is something that we're very, very good at. So reaching out to the Java communities, uh, building tools and technologies that I'll show you in a minute, and um, um, getting feedback from people like yourselves to figure out what the next version of these things should be. So Azure is a very open cloud. As I mentioned, there's 25% uh, of our uh, VMs uh, run Linux. Uh, and most of these tools here we've partnered with to deliver uh, the best platform that you can get for an open technology. So the idea here is we're not going to make you learn any new technologies. We're not going to make you learn .NET or Windows or Visual Studio. You can use your current IDEs. Uh, you can use your current tools for DevOps, uh, for management, for apps, you know, Tomcat, Jetty, uh, Glassfish, anything you want to bring on, Oracle, uh, IBM. Uh, we have been working with those vendors to make sure that their tools run well on Azure. <clears throat> so um, this is just an overview of some of the partners that we have been working with and things we've developed. So how many people here have had some experience with Azure? 
just a couple. See, then that's normal. Uh, how many people have been working with other cloud platforms, AWS, other things like that? Okay, about double. Okay, and some of you haven't worked on, how many people haven't worked on any cloud platforms at all? Okay, okay. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the offerings we have and some of the options you have for, for deploying things out to, to Azure as well. <clears throat> So uh, one of the things that, uh, how many people heard about our Eclipse? Uh, we've joined the Eclipse Foundation. How many people have heard about this? Yeah, quite a few. Okay, it was in the press all over the place. Uh, kind of cool. Um, uh, we've been working with uh, several Apache projects over the years, uh, and a lot of those Apache projects bleed over into Eclipse platform projects and um, offerings as well. Uh, Apache Shea is something that's been out there for a couple of years. If you haven't had a chance, it's an amazing uh, project um, and, and something that's pretty cool to work with. Um, but uh, Code Envy is a partner that we've been working with uh, in the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, they're very, they've quickly become very prominent in the Eclipse Foundation. They have an online IDE and an online framework for actually deploying things. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But as part of our work with them and other groups so working with Eclipse, uh, we've actually... Uh, joined the Eclipse Foundation as a member and um, partnering with them and looking forward to uh, what that brings for the future. Um, something else, how, how many people have heard about this? Bash on Windows, <laughs> yeah. We've been getting a lot of questions about this down at the booth. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. So we partnered with Canonical. It's real Bash. It's not in a VM. It's not an add-on. It's actually going to be native code when it comes out uh, sometime later this year, uh, and it's kind of cool. Um, you're going to be able to just open up a command window, and just like you would use DOS or anything else in Windows, you can use Bash. All the things you're used to, um, reaching, uh, uh, you know, downloading, getting code, getting binaries, uh, everything's going to work just the same as it would on Linux uh, with our partner with uh, Canonical. So I love that title, Bash on Windows, <laughs> Linux on Windows. The world is ending. <laughs> so, uh, for delivering code out to uh, Azure, there's several options. So, some of you put up your hands about uh, uh, you know being somewhat unfamiliar with the cloud platform. So, basically, there's two kinds of cloud uh, offerings that us and and our competitors offer. Uh, the first one is virtual machines. It's just like the server you're used to. Uh, you just put your code on that server. It's yours. You have to update the OS, whether it's Linux or Windows. Um, and you manage and have complete control over that server. Um, then we have scale sets, which is just a way to automatically scale VMs. Uh, and we have a brand new container service that just a couple of days ago went to GA, General Availability at Microsoft, means that it's available with SLAs and support and good things like that. Uh, to be uh, delivered to customers. It's been around for a while in beta, but now it's basically in its uh, early versions. And aside from that, we've got pass platform. So we've got a cloud platform where we manage the OS and we actually uh, control the, the versions and things like that that go on that platform. Uh, we also have an app service, which is we control the... OS platform, but we also control the underlying app application servers as well. Um, so it's a little bit more sandboxed over there on the far side. Um, service, service fabric in the middle. Um, some of you uh, might have seen the, the uh, demos that we had at our big conference uh, a couple of weeks ago called Build. Uh, it's a self-healing uh, application management platform. So when you take applications from your local uh, data center and you move them out to the cloud, uh, there's a lot of things to consider. How do you do scaling? How do you do reliability? Uh, how do you do upgrades without bringing down part of the server? How do you roll back if an upgrade didn't work properly? Uh, app Service Fabric is built to manage that kind of thing for you. And that's on Windows. Uh, we are bringing out some Linux-based servers as well. Something similar that, how many people have worked with Cloud Foundry? Worked with uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry as well? 
Okay, so we've got just one of you. <laughs> Cloud Foundry has a similar platform, all Linux-based, uh, and uh, we've been partnering with them to deliver their Cloud Foundry platform on, uh, on Azure as well. So these are just some of the options you have for delivering your applications. Uh, over here, uh, as I mentioned, for virtual machines, uh, for developers, we've got toolkits for uh, IntelliJ and Eclipse. Uh, we have uh, Jenkins compatibilities. We've got some plugins for Jenkins as well. Um, as we mentioned, we, we run all the popular versions of Linux. Uh, we have application servers that have been tested and work fine on Azure as well. Jetty, Oracle Web Logic, uh, WebSphere, Tomcat, Glassfish, uh, and a few others. Let me show you uh, a little bit about these. So here's the dashboard. How many people have seen the Azure dashboard before? This is the actual Azure portal. OK, so this is the dashboard of the Azure portal. Uh, and this is the experience you have as a regular uh, developer. You can get a free trial and go in here and try this out for yourself. Um, if I hit New and I go to the Marketplace, say See All, I can see everything we have here. Uh, there's literally thousands of pre-made uh, elements. So you can create, for example, uh, a virtual machine uh, with just Ubuntu running on it. Or you can have a pre-configured virtual machine that runs Tomcat, has a JDK that's compatible, and uh, the right version of Ubuntu for compatibility with the app server and the JDK. So if I just type Java here, you can see what we have. Um, in this case, these are all offerings that we have on Azure that are pre-configured that you can use right out of the box. Uh, in this case, um, JRuby stack, uh, Tomcat. If you look over here on the right, it says virtual machines. That means you can, this is a pre-configured virtual machine you can use. Uh, we've got JBoss. Uh, that's an offering from Bitnami. Uh, we've been talking about working with Red Hat directly on developing some JBoss things, uh, so watch this space for that. Uh, we also have, this is a web and mobile app, uh, so it's Tomcat that actually runs in a sandboxed environment. In this case, all you need to do, you know, Tomcat on a virtual machine is pretty self-explanatory. It's a virtual machine. It runs, uh, I believe, Ubuntu in this case. Uh, yeah, it's running on Ubuntu, uh, 14.04, the most common version. Uh, but if we go back to the web app, so the web app itself, it doesn't tell you it's running on any operating system because we have a sandboxed environment that actually gets created. Um, the environment gets created. Tomcat gets dropped on top of it automatically for you. All you need to do is bring your WAR file or your Java code over to it. So the idea here is if you're, uh, if you're in need of a customized Linux environment, you can create a VM. If you just need a place to run some Java and you really don't want to have to worry about setting up a server right now, you can put it on our web app. And uh, that runs pretty well as well. Um, what else do we have? We always have a few new surprises in here. It's, it changes every day. Uh, so uh, Jelastic, we've got in here, a uh, pre-made Jelastic uh, offering. Uh, Zulu, how many people are familiar with uh, Azul's OpenJDK? A few of it? OK. So there's the Oracle JDK, of course. Uh, Azul also has an OpenJDK offering. Uh, with, uh, and we've been working in partnership with them to build uh, Zulu, which is a uh, very cloud-optimized version of the OpenJDK. Uh, and other than that, we have WebSphere. There's the Pivotal Cloud Foundry that I mentioned earlier. This is a pre-configured Cloud Foundry environment. All you need to do is click here. <coughs> and if you have uh, infrastructure where you're running Cloud Foundry, uh, you can just run your applications and your infrastructure on Azure. Uh, we have WebSphere, uh, several versions of that. Uh, other than that, if I hit the load more, there's even more that comes up. We have Oracle and a few other instances here. But you get the idea. We have a bunch of pre-configured uh, application uh, sets that you can just 
take and use. Some of these are bring your own license uh, for in the case of Oracle and WebSphere. How do people use Oracle or WebSphere here? Okay, just a couple. So there's, uh, there's a couple ways to use it. There's um, Oracle uh, pre, uh, pre-created pay-as-you-go images. And what that means is uh, we actually have the license bundled into the image itself. So if you need a quick server to set up, fire up for a customer or for a project that you're working on with a team inside your organization, you can actually just fire up one of these pay-as-you-go images and you pay by the minute for that. You don't have to negotiate a new license with Oracle. Uh, if you have excess licenses, um, you can actually use uh, a bring your own license instance that we already have on here as well for Linux. Uh, and uh, those will uh, allow you to use the licenses you're not using. Um, how many people here have uh, MSDN subscriptions in their organization? OK, a few of you. Um, are you aware? Uh, you might not be aware, uh, there is a credit on Azure. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, uh, as part of your MSDN subscription with your organization, usually it's about $150 uh, per month, uh, at least, could be more. Uh, a lot of people that I've met uh, in dev teams had excess Azure minutes that they were using and excess Oracle licenses or WebSphere licenses, and they set up some servers for testing, and it didn't actually cost them any more uh, money than the company was already spending on their MSDN subscription and their Oracle licenses. So that's a nice option. So that's just a little bit about the uh, Azure Marketplace. Um, app Service, so I mentioned App Service. I mentioned VMs. I showed you the difference between the two with the Tomcat server. Uh, there's several other uh, implementations of uh, MongoDB. There's Hadoop, uh, Puppet, all kinds of pre-configured VMs and things you can use as well. So that's how you actually get code on to Azure. It's what we call lift and shift. So take your code from your data center, from your local environment, put it out onto the cloud. The next thing we have is we actually have some Azure services. And how you actually access those services is through our SDK. So our Java SDK, for example, runs on Windows, Mac, Linux. Uh, we have integrated uh, environments in IntelliJ and Eclipse that use the SDK to deploy things. Um, and what can you actually do with these services? So let's say you have an application now, uh, and part of the application itself needs scalable uh, storage and scalable SQL DB. You can use our app services to connect to uh, your application and build out the scalable part of that. Uh, I have a little demo here that I can show you here that sort of illustrates this. So this is uh, something called Azure Chat for Java. It's an application that runs on Tomcat. It's a Java application. And it is probably familiar to most of you in terms of a social media app. Uh, <coughs> it's a little bit like Snapchat in the sense that it, um, the, the posts that I put in here expire. But you can say, uh, you can put a post out, and you see it actually show up over here. There it is. Uh, I can add a photo. Yeah, let's take a picture here, one I maybe haven't used. I can post the picture, and it shows up over here in the timeline. All my friends can see what I have. Other friends can't because you actually log in uh, to this application uh, running on Tomcat. Uh, you can also put video in here, and you can set the expiry for things. Now, what is a, why, why I'm actually showing you this, uh, this is an application that uses a lot of the services that I just described. So when you're actually, uh, when I typed hi in here, uh, it's actually storing that in an Azure uh, table. It's a little bit like a blob, but uh, stored separately. I can like any one of these posts. I can make a comment. And that comment shows up here. So it's just um, the reason why this was built was 
we had a customer, actually more than one customer, who said, all right, don't just tell me that Java runs on Azure. Show me a Tomcat application running that uses all the services that you're describing. So that's what we did. We built this application for that. And what it uses, it's out on GitHub. This is the actual application itself. Azure Chat for Java. It uses uh, access control service, which is actually an older way of doing authentication, but it works. Um, we have a SQL database that stores users' profiles. Uh, we have Azure Tables, which manage the friend relationships. Uh, storage, stores the media like pictures and video and things like that. Azure Media Services manages the video encoding and streaming. And that's a great example of the th sorts of value add that you can get from an Azure service. Um, Azure Media Services, when you're actually building streaming media into your applications in Java, there's a few things you need to worry about. So first of all, you have to worry about how you're going to upload the data, actually upload the actual video, uh, store it, uh, encode it for all the different formats that the different clients need, uh, and then how do you do actually streaming of that video, and how do you scale that streaming? So these are the kinds of things you need to worry about. You can write all that code. There's libraries out there in open source. You can figure out how to do all this, or you can just use our Azure Media Services, which actually does all that for you. It actually stores the data, uh, encodes it in a number of formats, uh, and you have control over that, and then you can actually manage scaling and streaming from that as well, including digital right ma rights management and all kinds of things. It's all built into the Azure Media Service, uh, and you pay for that, but uh, in general, it's probably a lot cheaper than actually building and delivering the service yourself, uh, and it includes storage and things like that. Um, Azure Queue Storage uh, manages the video uploads, so we had an issue with um, uploading the videos where uh, we're storing them to a blob, and it was just a little bit slow. So what we did is we actually created an uh, extra blob. We put the uh, high-speed blob. It's a little bit faster than the regular blobs. Uh, we put the video in there, and then we use Azure uh, Queue Storage to actually manage the video itself and load it into Media Services when Media Services is ready to, to process it. Then we use Service Bus Queues to manage deletion of items. Now, there's something called Storage Explorer that kind of explains a little bit more about how this works. This is a downloadable Windows app, uh, and you can look into your storage uh, account to see what, what's going on in there. So in this case, um, if I look here in Photos, it shows me the photos that I just uploaded. This is the one I just uploaded. Um, there's user profile pics, so all the users that are on the system. As I mentioned, you know, I see the feeds. Other people see the feeds as well. So all the uh, relationship management and things is, is uh, managed through here. Um, and then we have Azure Tables. And Tables, so there's a little bit of a difference with Tables and Blobs. So Blobs are storing files, any binary items. Tables store rows of data. They're not um, like SQL tables. You don't have to set columns. The column lengths can be uh, different. The data types can be different. It's just a very, it's, it's sort of a hybrid between SQL and NoSQL data. So in there, I manage all my friend requests. These are all the friend requests that we've had. Uh, any comments, so I made a comment in one of the posts there. Uh, here it is here. Uh, any likes, there's the like there. And um, any other messages that get posted, I think the post here couple other things. So what happens here is I have a service bus application that actually runs through this on a timer task and deletes things as I go along. So it saves for storage and things. So it's just a cool little uh, sample. And if you download this from GitHub and read through the documentation and set it all up, you'll learn how to set up a whole bunch of services on Azure as well as make a Java application interact with those services. And we have some best use cases uh, encapsulated in the code for this. So you can take that code and build it into your own applications for, for Azure. So um, that's the idea behind all these services. Uh, it's beyond lift and shift. So you can actually take your code, put it on to Azure, it'll run fine. But if you actually want to take your code to the next level, uh, you can build and use these services as well. And by the way, this thing, um, <laughs> I just fired it up this morning. It's been running since May... 2014, and I haven't rebooted this Tomcat server or anything. I've never had any issues with the services, so it's pretty solid, pretty stable. I think it's pretty cool that it, it just runs like that. I don't know anybody in a data center who could say the same thing about a 
an application they put on Tomcat you know, that it would just be running for two years without any restarts. So <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, Azure manages all the uh, all the uh, service connections and the actual service itself that this is running on. And as I mentioned, you can get it on GitHub and, and download it and play around with it. Another cool example of the SDKs. So let me show you. Let me go back to the browser here. Uh, here we go. Ah. So the SDKs themselves. Seems like I've down, lost that page. Hang on a sec. Uh, sure. So the Azure SDKs themselves, uh, the Java SDK is the one that I just showed you highlighted in that application. But there's all kinds of other SDKs in case you're looking for one for another language. .NET, Node.js, we're really leaders in Node.js these days, PHP, Python, Ruby, and mobile. So we have a mobile SDK. It runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux, as well as iOS and Android. Uh, and what does this actually do? So part of the mobile service that we have is the SDK. So you can actually build applications that use um, your code that exists already uh, to build applications that run on mobile devices. Uh, and that could be Windows, iOS, Android, Xamarin. And behind the scenes, we use a lot of the things that I just described earlier. Uh, SQL, table storage, blob storage, also haven't covered that yet, but MongoDB. Uh, you can use user authentication through federation with uh, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, et cetera. And we have push notifications on all the major platforms as well. So it just gives you an example of some of the other things you could do. Uh, you can download the uh, SDK if you just search for Azure downloads, uh, and that's a good start to use the mobile services with the code that you've probably already written. Uh, how many people here use IntelliJ or Eclipse? Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to show you a couple of tools we have. So I mentioned that uh, you know all these uh, applications are available, and what we've done is we actually built tools for Eclipse and IntelliJ that make it easier to deploy things out to Azure. When you're actually deploying things out to Azure, there's a number of considerations you have. Let me switch over to Eclipse quick. So there's a number of considerations you have when you're actually developing and building applications. So you take a web project or any kind of Java project that you already have in Eclipse, and you can actually, with our plugin, which you can get on the Eclipse Marketplace or the IntelliJ Marketplace, um, with that plugin, when you right click on Eclipse, uh, you can see three different options. I've actually got several plugins on here. Uh, so, Application Insights is something I'll cover in a little bit, uh, which is a way to uh, run logistics, and I'm sorry, not logistics, but uh, run analytics on your Java applications. You can also publish this app as an Azure web app. I mentioned Azure Web Apps are just the simple sandboxed Tomcat server uh, out there, or Jetty. And actually, by the way, the web apps aren't just limited to Tomcat and Jetty. You can customize your own. But those are the default ones that come with the web app service. Um, and you can also set up an Azure Cloud service. So if I click on set up an Azure Cloud service for this application, it's going to load my account settings. It takes a second. All right, so I can create something from my uh, published settings file. And this is something that you get when you're uh, setting up your uh, accounts in Azure. As I mentioned, there's a free trial. Uh, <laughs> you can uh, uh, set up a storage account for actually delivering this application. Uh, you can create a service name for it. Uh, you can choose your target OS. In this case, it doesn't go to VMs. It goes to what we call our cloud services. And you can have Windows to Server 2008 to 2012. Uh, and there's a couple other things you set. Once you set that, uh, basically you can deploy things out to Azure uh, relatively quickly. Web apps is very similar. Actually, you have less options with web apps because it's more sandboxed. Uh, and there's a couple of other options in there. Uh, for example, you can set up 
multiple endpoints to actually deploy this to. So if you want to deploy uh, your application in Eclipse out to 11 uh, web apps, uh, you can do that through here, uh, or 11 nodes on a, a cloud service, uh, and have them all connected and, and working together. So the Eclipse plugin is good for that. Uh, the IntelliJ plugin is essentially the same. Uh, it's just a way to allow you to quickly try things out uh, on uh, Eclipse and get it out to Azure to see how it's going to work on Azure. All right, so um, how many people use MongoDB here? OK, cool. So we have a tool called DocumentDB that we've built. Um, if anyone uses Microsoft OneNote, uh, DocumentDB uh, is actually what runs on the back end uh, of, uh, of OneNote. Traditionally, we've had REST over HTTP for this, but we have a new announcement. We have actually a MongoDB wire protocol. So if you have a MongoDB application, if you have a Java application you've already invested in connecting to a MongoDB server, um, you can actually use our DocumentDB service on the back end as well using the MongoDB wire protocol that we've, we've built. Uh, how many people use Jenkins? OK, cool. Uh, we have a couple of plugins for Jenkins that we built as well. Uh, the first one is just a simple Azure storage plugin, so you can take your artifacts from Jenkins. Uh, you can uh, in incorporate a part of your stream uh, deploying out to um, Azure Storage. And when you publish out to Azure Storage, it just goes out there. And then you can trigger distribution from there. Uh, it's just a file system at that point, And uh, you can just deliver it to wherever you need it to be delivered. Uh, one of the more complicated uh, plugins that we built was a slave plugin for Azure. So how many people are familiar with the Jenkins slave concept? OK, a few of you. So the idea here is um, when you're running Jenkins, you can run uh, multiple instances of Jenkins. A master instance controls a bunch of slave instances. Those slave instances, in this case, uh, if you use our plugin, can be uh, Microsoft Azure Virtual Machines, Linux or Windows. Uh, you create a template that gets used in Azure, and that template uh, will create as many uh, Azure Virtual Machines as you need uh, at, at any time, and you can set up the scaling for that too if you're over a certain percentage of uh, work at another scale, um, a scale set of these. Uh, the idea here uh, as well is that these, when you're done with them, don't get just completely shut down. You have the option of just putting them into dormant mode. You can shut them down as well, but you can put them into a dormant mode. So if you're going to be using them a lot, you can go out and use them again. Um, they'll be ready to go and, and be spun up as well. Um, now, shutting them down completely saves you a little bit of money on Azure uh, storage, but um, keeping them in the dormant mode is actually pretty good for performance. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, Visual Studio, bleh, Visual Studio Team Services. Um, this is a, uh, how many people are familiar with Team Foundation Server? A couple of you? OK. <laughs> well, this is uh, Team Foundation Server Online, basically. Uh, and <clears throat> one of the nice things about it uh, is we have an offering right now. Uh, of you can set up as many private repos as you want on uh, Visual Studio Team Services. Uh, it, we have application integration with Java. And um, the repos themselves, private repos, can be up to five uh, people. Uh, and the private repos, uh, so as many private repos as you want, up to five people are free. Uh, so if you have clients or something that you want to share code with, or you have teams inside your organization that are smaller than five, uh, it's uh, completely free to use as many repos as you need to uh, per project, so five people per project, uh, to actually build applications and share them. It's kind of cool. <coughs> um, to do that, uh, there's a, let me see here. So, 
So uh, cloud-hosted tools for Java teams. Uh, there's a website if you just go to team, uh, uh, Visual Studio Team Services Java. Just search on that. You'll come to this page, and uh, you can get started there. It's a free account to set up with. Um, and uh, this is not part of the free trial. This is free for, uh, for the time being. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, uh, up to five people per repo uh, can access that repo for free. Unlimited uh, downloads and integrations. Application insights for Java. That's another thing I want to mention. Oh, actually, before I get there, uh, let's talk about Cloud Foundry for a second. Uh, I'm sorry, not Cloud Foundry, Code Envy. <laughs> we also have the Code Envy Agile plugin for VSTS. I mentioned uh, early in the presentation I would tell you about this. So um, at Eclipse uh, Con in Reston, Virginia, uh, a few weeks ago, we mentioned that we've joined the Eclipse Foundation. We've also partnered with Cloud Envy to um, to actually put together this plugin uh, and work with them closely. So they have several things uh, that make this a cool thing. How many people have heard of Code Envy? All right, so a few of you. <laughs> um, if you get a chance, they're in the Eclipse booth here. They're pretty cool stuff. Uh, so the idea here is um, they generate workspaces that you uh, can use. These are 100% online workspaces. Uh, with pre-configured environments with compatible app servers, JDKs, and instances of your code all put together and running. Uh, what we've done, partnering with them, is with Visual Studio Team Services, we've created a way, if you're in Visual Studio Team Services, it's 100% online. Uh, you can click down here in the Code Envy section and you can create a new developer workspace or reviewer workspace. So what this does is instead of having to set up different environments, uh, you probably do this with something like Jenkins. It's a version control system now. Uh, instead of having to set up different environments for reviewing, for developing with different teams, uh, for prototyping, you can just create these workspaces. And when you click on developer workspace, for example, it takes you over to the Code Envy page, and the Code Envy page has several options for different kinds of workspaces you can build. And you're, you would actually pre-configure the workspace with your code and compatible app servers and JDKs and things ready to go in there. It actually gets deployed onto a Code Envy workspace. And you can test it. You can code with it. You can review it. It's not going to damage your current work streams uh, in terms of delivering code. So it's kind of a nice way to create disposable developer environments and testing environments uh, <clears throat> without having to spend uh, a lot of money on servers and, and environments and even cloud services for doing that. Um, so this plugin actually integrates with Visual Studio Team Services, which as I mentioned is free and has repos uh, of up to five people for free as well on GitHub. Uh, but it'll also allow you to, with this plugin, deploy out to uh, Code Envy and run your environments on Code Envy itself. Uh, and this, by the way, is in the Visual Studio Marketplace. There's actual Visual Studio Marketplace where you can actually build uh, and uh, sell tools or give away tools as well. OK. So application insights for Java. Uh, this is a way of testing your applications. It's code free. so. Um, there, you can add some code to do specific things with specific activities inside your Java code. We have agents that you can plug in. Or if you download the SDK and just put it alongside your code in a Tomcat server or any other app server, uh, and you set up an instrumentation key that you can get for free from <coughs> App Insights. And once you've done that, uh, they will actually record certain logistics. Uh, for example, uh, different locations of Azure 16, I believe, at the moment. Uh, they will actually ping locations, test uh, performance, and a few other things. Put all that data on a dashboard that is supplied by them, and you can just review the data on the dashboard. It's a pretty cool tool. Um, application insights for Java, if you just search on that. So in the end, uh, you know, all these things we've been building, basically, uh, we love Java. <laughs> we want to get as many applications and as many Java developers uh, working on Azure as we can. 
Uh, and we're always open to feedback. If you guys have used our tools before, let us know. We'd like to hear how it's going. If you haven't used them, please try them out. There is a free trial. Um, and uh, got a few uh, QR codes. I'll be sharing these slides after. So um, we do need your feedback. We have a survey here. Uh, if anybody's interested in filling that out. We also have a, uh, a group called Java Advisors, which is a... Um, it's a Yammer group. It's a private group. Uh, you join and you can share information and share resources among uh, <coughs> different uh, customers using Java on Azure. And also you have interaction with uh, us, the engineers. You'll also have you know, early access to some of our tools and things to try out as well. Um, we also have the Azure Java Dev Center uh, that you can check out. It covers most of what I've talked about here today. And there's a really, really long blog with pretty much every possible uh, part of Azure that's of interest to a Java developer uh, out there as well. So uh, I'll be sharing these slides after, but that's about it. And we'll take some questions. No? Boy, I was really good or really bad. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no. Well, Redis. We have a Redis service, by the way. Uh, I forgot to mention that in the in the slide. But this is one of the deployment slides we have. But um, so Redis would be you know key value pairs. Um, this is more for unstructured data that you want that's not necessarily no SQL data, but it's just unstructured rows of data that you want to store. For example. Um, I used it for building the relationships in, in my uh, uh, Azure Chat for Java application. Just cause it was easy to build that in, and if I needed to add a column, I didn't have to go back and change my schema. I could just work with, the, um, with what I had and add the column to data from then on. Uh, and it's fast. So it is similar to a key value pair idea. It's really quick to just look things up and retrieve data, but it's not necessarily, com you know, it's not a competitor to Redis or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, it's a it's a lot it's a it's a lot a lot of variations there that could be there, but yes, in general, uh, you know, if you have data in Azure SQL, it's compatible with SQL, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft SQL database. So you could actually download that to a Microsoft SQL database and then theoretically use that to convert to Oracle or any other platform that you'd want to do that with. Uh, one of the nice things about our containers, uh, if you're using the container service. Everything on the underlying structure is open source. So it's not that we're writing these for you to be able to move them around with different places. That is the goal, actually. But for now, we are structuring everything open source so that when the time comes when these things are compatible with different cloud platforms and things, you will be able to, to transfer them, if that helps. Yeah. But yes, uh, it's a very, I mean, there's a lot of variations in the question you asked. It, you know, it's a lot of things that could be gotchas, especially if you have a really complicated SQL structure and things like that. Or you might have some storage or something like that. So that's why I was sort of hemming and hawing a little bit. But yeah, in general, you should be able to download everything. We're not locking anyone in. That's the whole idea with, with Azure. And, you know, it works both ways. So we're really... Uh, you know, we are adopting open source technologies so that you don't have to learn any new technologies to get your things on Azure. But as a byproduct of that, I guess you could, you know, move things around as well. But hopefully you wouldn't have to do that. If you're, if you're not happy with something, let us know and hopefully we can fix it. So <laughs> that's, that's the better idea for us. Anything else? Yes.
Uh, do we contribute to it? We do, actually. Uh, so we've made a couple of contributions. So the question was, do we contribute to the uh, Windows op uh, implementation of the OpenJDK? Yes, and actually we contributed to the Linux as well. We have two, I think right now we have two accepted contributions. It's a new world. Uh, two accepted contributions from uh, our Java engineers at Microsoft have been accepted into the new Java stream, which should, they should be in Java 9 when it comes out. So that's pretty cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, the red light is blinking. We have 15 seconds if anyone does. So, okay. Thank you.